Thank you so much for everyone joining us today. This is the Breaking the Silence, the Hidden Realities of Female Genital Mutilation slash Cutting, or FGMC, in the United States. My name is Amanda Parker. I'm Senior Director of the AHA Foundation, and I've been working for over 13 years now to end FGM in the U.S. I've worked with survivors, legislators, with coalitions, with frontline service providers, really the gamut. And I am incredibly proud to host this webinar and share the findings from analysis that was done by study author Sean Callahan with every one of you, but particularly with those of you who are doing work on the front lines with us to end this practice in the US. Sean's analysis breaks new ground in understanding the prevalence, distribution, and impact of FGMC in the US. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what this webinar is about, but first I wanna tell you what it is not. This is not a webinar that is an intro to female genital mutilation. The impacts of the practice or why people continue the practice. You can find similar seminars to those on our YouTube channel or on our website, theahafoundation.org. This webinar is meant to spend time discussing the findings of a report we recently published. We will cover the research and analysis behind the report developed over the past five years, or at least the research was done over the last five years, by FGM expert, advocate, and PhD student, Sean Callahan. Sean is a dedicated researcher specializing in the critical field of female genital mutilation slash cutting. With a passion for understanding and combating this harmful practice, Sean has delved into extensive research to illuminate its pre prevalence, impact, and underlying factors. His work goes beyond statistics, aiming to foster awareness and contribute to the global dialogue on eradicating FGMC. Through his commitment to unraveling the complexities surrounding this practice, Sean stands at the forefront of efforts to protect and empower affected communities. So let me tell you how we're gonna organize this next hour. We will first present the methodology that Sean employed in his study. We'll learn how it's different from the methodology used by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Population Reference Bureau. Then we will dive into key findings of the FGM report. We will leave approximately 15 minutes for questions at the end of the session. Please feel free to send them in using the, the Q&A box at any time. We will answer all of the questions that come through either today during our webinar or if we run out of time, we will follow up with an email in the coming days You'll also receive a video recording of the webinar in a few days time. So now let me introduce you to Sean, author of the study. Hello, Sean, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Amanda, it's a pleasure. So back in 2018, our executive director, George Zerubin and I watched with serious excitement as you presented to the US Network on FGMC on mapping FGMC in the United Kingdom. Your research was able to show with an unprecedented level of specificity, which UK communities housed populations from particular countries with high prevalence, prevalence rates of FGMC. George and I were both immediately struck with how useful that information would be to us here in the United States. We knew how much better AHA Foundation and other organizations like ours could do our work by understanding exactly where to target our programs and which populations we were working with, therefore informing which interventions were necessary and would make an impact. Five years later, I really couldn't be more excited to finally share the findings of your report with our audience. Sean, when you embarked on this project and your research, what were your main goals? Thanks, Amanda. Um, so the four main goals are uh, to establish the scale and distribution of FGM in the US, updating the CDC's uh, 2012, uh, 2016 data, um, accounting for the impact of migration and acculturation on those estimates, segmenting that population between those living with and those likely to be at risk of, FGM in the future, and then mapping that down to a more granular level than had been done in the past. So before this study, the number that we that we had available and that we we have all been widely um, discussing within our networks 
was as many as 513,000 women and girls were potentially impacted in the United States. And that was from the CDC study released in 2016 based on data from 2012. There was also a Population Reference Bureau study around that same time that had similar information from 2013 or similar results. Um, that CDC study gave us no breakdown below the state or metro level, no split between living with and at risk of FGM, and no accounting for the impact of migration on the process or on the practice. How is the methodology for your study the same, and how is it different from the methodology used by previous studies of FGM in the U.S.? So it's... It's similar in the sense that it's similar to the methodology that the CDC and PRB used. It's similar to the methodology that the um, is used in Europe as well, um, the, the extrapolation method. Um, and at its core, it uses, it has three input, input variables. Um, the study population um, in the US, uh, which we get from the census data, the prevalence of FGM in the countries of origin, which we get from national health surveys. And then finally, how those uh, numbers are impacted and nuanced by migration and acculturation. And then those three are multiplied together in order to create an estimate. So for example, if you have a hundred Somali women in a community with a 99% uh, prevalence rate back home, you, um, are essentially saying that there's 99 potentially impacted Somali women in that community. Likewise, 100 Nigerian women in that same community with a 19% prevalence back home, so another 19 potentially impacted Nigerian women. And so those 200 women in that neighborhood, we would estimate 118 are impacted. That's without taking um, migration impact into account. So you say that your methodology was similar. What what did you change from the PRB and the CDC? Yeah, the previous studies um, had significant limitations, both with the prevalence data and the population data, and they didn't uh, in any way account for the acculturation. So how did you address those limitations in your study? So... Let me talk you through each of the variables because that really, you know, touches on it. So the first thing I did with the population data is I included po populations that weren't in um, that weren't included in previous studies. So most notably the Asian populations, so the Malay, the Indonesian, and to some extent the Dawodi Bora. Um, each of those are known to have high prevalence, and none of them were included in the previous studies. Um, but also then thinking about how we assign risk um, to a population. And let, let me throw up a slide here because I think this really speaks to it. In the previous studies, risk was assigned based on place of birth. And so someone born in, um, in, in Somalia would have been uh, given a 99% um, prevalence. But somebody born in Ethiopia or in Kenya would have been given a much smaller um, prevalence because they were assigned Ethiopian or Kenyan. But you can see from the map that the Somali regions of Kenya and the Somali regions of Ethiopia both have essentially the same prevalence as Somalia. And so the key is to identify the ethnicity of the person and assign, um, assign by that. And the US population data has ancestry codes. And so we use those to assign um, to the to, to the population, and the result of that was a you know one point three million women that were then part of the uh, of the study population, which we then were able to attach ancestral ties to. the The second variable around prevalence data in in previous uh, studies only only used uh, national prevalence data, and so. Uh, you know, national average data. And rather than that, I took the process of developing age-specific data. And, and I want to kind of just show you with a couple of slides, just showing the impact of that. These are the three prevalence studies done in Ethiopia, for example, um, uh, sorted by 
uh, time difference so you can see the trend. And then I took that and added a trend line to it. Um, and if we add the national prevalence, um, which was 65% back then, and you know, what one would do by doing that is if we use the national prevalence, you underestimate the woman living with FGM and you overestimate the children at risk of FGM. And so taking that into account, we then based on 80 um, plus national survey spanning 25 years, supplemented by academic studies, and then aligned to the 2019 population, we were able to calculate age-specific prevalence data, which there is a table at the back of the report that has the, the data set, the, the results of that data set. Um, and then the final one was um, was to was to actually add in um, some a, a variable on the acculturation and using a similar method to used by uh, studies in the Netherlands, we developed a set of scenarios, which we then uh, used to, to develop the, the scenarios that are presented in this, uh, in this report. Tell us about the difference between the estimates that you calculated the, the bigger number, the 577,000 number versus the more realistic estimate. Yeah, so and this I'm going to step through a couple of these tables, and this is a little dense, I, I realize, but I, maybe just talk you through it. So from the population data set, there were 1.3 million women and girls who were connected with a country of interest that, that we identified. Of those... 940,000 were born overseas and 385,000 were born in the US. Of those who were born overseas, most of them migrated after the age of cutting in their country. Some 200,000 odd um, migrated before or during the age of cutting. And then if we take those and push them through the the, the prevalence data, so we take that population multiplied by the prevalence data, we end up with um, this 577,000 um, potentially impacted, which is my equivalent to the PRB CDC uh, method. And, and that's kind of where they stopped with, with their data set. Um, what we then did is we took that 577 and we divided it into these three, into these three groups. Those that migrated after the age of cutting, we assumed that they were cut at whatever the prevalence was back home. So if they were Somalis who migrated when they were 25, we assumed that 98% of them were cut, 99% of them were cut. If they were Nigerians who migrated when they were 25, we assumed that 19% uh, of them were cut. Um, those who migrated during the age of cutting or before the age of cutting, so a Somali who migrates around seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, we make the assumption that there is a 50% drop in the, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the prevalence based on the mitigating factors around migration and acculturation. And those that were then born in the US, we assume a 75% drop. So that gets us down to uh, 415, 416,000 more likely impacted by FGM in the US. But we didn't stop there. We then looked at age of cutting versus current age and then estimated that about 385,000 women or girls are currently living in the US who have already experienced FGM, most of whom were cut before they migrated, and about 31,000 are potentially at risk in the future. The breaking it down to potentially at risk is something that is, is revolutionary for us at the AHA Foundation compared to what we had before, which was just those who were you know, the cutoff of age 18, which is really meaningless in terms of the world of preventing FGM. So which of the key findings in this study were more or the most surprising to you, Sean? 
Well, let me just touch on that before I get your question. That you know, I think the the key thing here is almost all Nigerians, the vast majority of Nigerians, are cut within the first year of life, as are Indonesians and Malaysians, for example. And so, a seventeen-year-old. Indonesian or Nigerian is really not at risk of FGM. They're either living with FGM or they aren't going to be cut at all. Um, where uh, you know, whereas a one-year-old Somali is potentially at risk in the future. Um, at, you know, and I think that that that, that that's the, the key in in understanding that. You know, the finding that really jumps out at me in all of this is um, in that five hundred seventy-seven thousand. And by implication, in the 513,000 that the CDC did, are those who migrated or were born in the US and, and are already past the age of cutting and therefore were potentially cut in the US. In other words, there was a crime committed while resident in the US. And that number in my 577,000 is 113,000 potential crimes committed. Or even in the 416,000 scenario, it's still 35,000 crimes that have been committed while resident in the US and another 31,000 that are potentially going to be committed. And I think for me, that was that really jumped out at me. And I, uh, in, in the follow on study that I'm doing, I met up with somebody from uh, one of the child advocacy centers this, this last week and just asked her, do those numbers sound out of the ballpark? You know, I mean, given the amount of child abuse or whatever, however, you, you know, kind of other numbers, uh, DV numbers and, you know, in, in the US. And she said, no, those don't sound out of the ballpark. And I, that really struck me as, okay, I, I, I didn't think that was the number we were talking about. Um, you know, what, what that number says to me is either we're massively inflated the risk or we've really failed to protect a whole lot of people. I completely agree with you. And, and we've talked about those two possibilities prior to this call, Sean, and contemplating numbers like that. Um, it's just truly heartbreaking. I was also personally really surprised by the more than 68,000 women and girls in the U.S. estimated to have undergone type 3 FGM, which is the most severe type and that really emphasizes the critical need for healthcare providers, including mental health care providers, to learn how to treat patients who have undergone FGM with understanding and with competency. It shows even more important how the training programs for medical professionals like the ones AHA Foundation leads in Chicago and Los Angeles and other places are. And knowing now that half of those survivors likely living with type 3 FGM were from five states, including Minnesota, Ohio, California, Texas, and Washington helps organizations like ours target our work. And it really shows the need for resources and critically for funding to be made available and targeted specifically for those particular states and for communities within those states. And something that we haven't really touched on yet is that your study goes beyond talking about the big picture national look at the United States and also goes much deeper into state level information as well. And at the end of the report, there are two page spreads for almost every single US state, except for the ones with lower prevalence FGM rates in the US. And those are grouped together by, by geographic region. Um, and I just wanted to highlight also something that was, um, I guess not surprising, but just really stark to me was that the top three states in the US, as far as, um, number of potentially impacted women and girls were also the top three states that had the biggest increases in number of population from the CDC and Population Reference Bureau studies. And those yeah. were California, Minnesota, and Texas. Um, those were also included in those states of the top states with um, women and girls who are likely living with type 3 FGM. And yeah. go ahead. Yeah, the, the the other one for me um, is just how young the at risk population is. Um, you know, in twenty nineteen, two thirds of that at risk population 
were girls in elementary school or younger. Um, and I think often we we think about where do we intervene? You know, here in the UK, we intervene kind of around middle school is where the, the school lessons are. And by that point, almost everybody in your lesson has already either experienced FGM or is no longer at risk of FGM. And I think, you know, it, that really speaks to where and when and how we, we intervene. Because obviously, what does age appropriate look like for a, a, a kindergarten intervention? But I think we have to think about that. Absolutely. And I know that we have we have some really great intervention programs that are for um, certainly schools later on, you know, in age, high school for sure. And I'm not sure maybe touching on middle school here in the U.S., but um, certainly I... Um, I think that we really need to put a greater focus on elementary school and younger and targeting those um, teachers, guidance counselors, all of those professionals that are likely to encounter those girls who, who may or may not be at risk. You know, that really leads us to the recommendations because at the end of the day, this is about what do we do with these numbers? And we, uh, we, built our recommendations based on this uh, 7P framework. Um, and I think it's maybe helpful for us just to talk that through a little bit. I mean, at the center of it is this idea of prevalence that we need We need to know what the numbers are. We need to know that 31,000. We need to know that there's um, 380 something thousand women who need support. Um, we, we, we need to know those numbers and we need to know where those numbers are. We need to know geography attached to that prevalence. It doesn't help to say in the US. Um, and, and we also need more accurate numbers. These uh, This research is based on the 2015-2019 population data set because all the population census data after that is contaminated by, uh, by the pandemic and the inability to get to certain households. And so these smaller populations get increasingly excluded when, when that happens. And so we really need to wait for the pandemic to wash through the data and come out, you know, 22, 23's data is probably going to be cleaner, but that is, that's only going to come out in 24, 25 from the Census Bureau. And that'll be the next time we can do this kind of analysis at, um, based on more reliable numbers. And circling back to this seven P's framework that we're looking at here, um, prevalence is framed by the four responses and, and one of those is partnership. And our recommendations for partnership is that, um, Sean, this report that you created really makes it clear that the scale and distribution of FGM in the US requires partnership across stakeholders to work towards ending this practice and supporting survivors. And we're talking about um, big partnerships from affected communities to civil society, frontline professionals, all levels of government, um, all of them must be working together. And you and I have both seen that there are many of these impactful networks that are already across the US, but they need to be strengthened. They need to be expanded. They need to be multiplied. Um, we need to see much more of this. Yeah, and you know, when you look at the, at the, uh, at the, the sort of micro geography of some of this, you know, some of those smaller communities were, which one wouldn't think have FGM in them. And that's really where we need to be building partnership. And then policy, you know, policy needs to be created, rooted in this, in, in this sort of more holistic response um, across again, all of those, uh, all of those different um, uh, levels of government and, and emphasizing partnership that really addresses the needs of survivors and is, and community-led prevention um, and that child protection and prosecution really needs to be at the end of the process not you know not fronted in it um, sort of a last line of defense um, absolutely um, and I keep thinking back to this finding from the study that there's an estimated 385,000 women and girls likely living in the United States who have already undergone FGM. And we know that they are receiving inadequate health care because 
We hear it from those survivors who are coming to us at the AHA Foundation saying that they are struggling trying to find a healthcare provider who will at minimum treat them like a human being and not make them feel um, different or other than when they visit their office and also understands how to treat their symptoms. And we also hear it from those, those medical professionals that we train at the AHA Foundation. They come to us one after another and tell us how sorely this training is needed for them. And it's, it's not just a one-time thing. It's not something that we can just come in and do a training and it's over with. This is something that from college through continuing education, medical providers should be learning not just how to treat patients impacted by all types, but particularly type three of FGM. Um, but we're not just talking about the knowledge to treat those complications associated with the practice. We're also talking about cultural sensitivities and communication that's needed to handle such a sensitive topic. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've spoken to a bunch of survivors in the last couple of weeks in the follow-on study, and th they bring this up over and over and over again. Um, and of course, prevention, you know, um, those 53,000 girls that had already migrated and yet we didn't prevent the 31,000 that are potentially at risk. How do we, uh, how do we prevent that? And, you know, in that study, the two and a half thousand that are being born each year based on the, uh, based, based on the fertility rate in that community um, that are potentially at risk uh, in, in the next, you know, in the next decade. Um, and so there's a real urgency to, to scale up prevention, um, but to do it in a way that is, is it a disciplinary that's centering um, uh, these communities that's dealing with that cross-cultural nuance that you spoke about, that's dealing with um, the, uh, the communication skills. And it, it's gonna, it's gonna require the medical sector, it's require educators, um, and uh, you know, but it really needs to be in partnership with uh, with affected communities, and being able to identify the signs of a girl who might be at risk and how to handle that. Um, you know, there's an there's an entire uh, ecosystem that needs to be created there. I think. Absolutely, and in terms of prosecution. As you said before, Sean, this is something that should always, always be used as a last resort. And our primary goal at AHA Foundation for any anti-FGM legislation that we have supported is prevention of the practice and support of survivors. Adequate, adequate legislation is key not only to aiding in prosecution and prevention, but also for all of these other responses that we've outlined and that we've discussed today. We've at the AHA Foundation already worked in more than two dozen states to support legislators in putting in place legislation that addresses FGM. But even so, there are still nine states and the District of Columbia that have yet to put in place state um, specific anti-FGM legislation. And the ninth or and the, the 41 states that have already passed anti-FGM laws, those laws really vary quite widely in their strength. A robust legal framework to facilitate FGM prevention, support survivors, and the prosecution of perpetrators is an important part of fighting FGM in the US. And it's really important that laws are honed to include additional provisions to more comprehensively fight FGM in the United States. We need to go beyond those goals of um, prevention and prosecution. We really need to also be working towards supporting survivors and equipping those professionals who are likely to encounter them. Yeah, and you know, the last of these seven um, uh, strategies and recommendations is, is protection. And, you know, I mean, uh, the starting point for me is that the vast majority of the 290,000 girls who are born in the US under the age of 15 are in this community, in these communities are not at risk. Um, but 31,000 of them are potentially at risk. And I think that's the key is being able to 
know how to protect the, the 31,000 in a way that doesn't uh, stigmatize the 290,000 and the 1.3 million um, women from these communities. Um, and, and to do that in, a, in an age appropriate and age specific way, um, you know, as we said earlier, knowing which age group is at risk for, um, uh, you know, based on the UNFPA's um, research on on age of highest risk, and and being able to to to, to plot that out so that we we know that a, a middle school class with Indonesian girls might actually be living with FGM, not at risk of FGM, and you know just ha having that in frame. Um, and finding the balance of protecting and not discriminating, you know, um, I think I hear that over and over again as I as I talk to survivors is that they really want that they want us to find that 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 middle road. Uh, they don't want us to just say, well, we can't do it, but at least clearly they don't want us to stereotype everybody. Absolutely, that's um, that's important for all of us to remember in in this work that we're doing. To make sure that we are not harming in the process of of trying to protect and support and those seven p's are really all about a comprehensive approach that's incorporating all of those factors that we discussed prevalence partnership policy prevention protection provision and prosecution all of these are vital in efforts to support the communities affected by this practice um, now i want to talk a little bit about some things that are not included within the report and High up on my list are maps that you have created, Sean. And I know that, that there are maps that you've created that can help us to really better target the work our do, that, that all of us are doing to end FGM in the US. And at the AHA Foundation, we really welcome those of you who are working to end FGM to contact us at info at the ahafoundation.org. And it's gonna be at the bottom of, of our slides, but it's info at the ahafoundation.org if this information would be useful to your work. We're not, we're not gonna publish this um, in granular detail online. This is not gonna be made available to the public, but it is something that we want to be available to you who are, are working on this in the US. So Sean, can you show us a little bit about these maps that you've created? Yeah, so, you know, a map like this um, is essentially what PRB gave us um, in their study in 2016, uh, which you know shows states with the highest prevalence. Um, I've broken that down to the county level, which obviously makes for a lot more uh, targeted intervention. And I know that so many decisions are made at the county level, and so that becomes really helpful and you know the new york counties we can see which ones are, are, are have higher prevalence but really what you want to do is be able to break it down to the neighborhood level and get a sense of you know in those counties where specifically and therefore which schools which clinics um which community centers are we talking about and each one of those you know we have interactive on the map so we can pop up exactly which location we're talking about, the study population that's resident there, the number that we estimate are living with and are at risk of um, in, in, that, uh, in that specific geography. And as you say, you know, this is really available to the sector uh, to, to help um, and uh, you know, just get hold of us at, at info at the ahafoundation.org and, and we can get you this and we can get you the, uh, the data sheets that are behind us, including which ethnicities are here, et cetera, et cetera. What's the age breakdown of the community um, and all of that. I see these maps and I think about um, the, the power that they hold. If, you, if you're working in those communities, you know where the schools are, you know where the hospitals are. We can overlay you know, the, those, those maps with that information and, and see exactly what schools we should be talking to, what what medical um, facilities we should be reaching out to, what what other organizations are there that we can partner with. I think it's I think it's really revolutionary in what it can do to 
help fine tune our work and, and help us do our jobs better. I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. So Sean, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to answer your question. So what's, what else is missing from this, uh, from this report? Indeed. Um, what else is missing from this report, Sean? Yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, I've been, you know, you and I, Amanda, we've been speaking to some community organizers in communities where we know there are uh, certain communities and yet they don't show up in the population data. And, and that's just a reality of, of census data that it isn't 100% foolproof. And so we know that that, that some communities are, are just not there. Um, we also know that, um, yeah, I, I did an interview with a Chadian um asylum seeker last week and, and and she's not here uh you know her data's not here because she uh the these smaller smaller populations are not included in the in the publicly ava available um data from uh from the census bureau and then of course we also know that there are uh americans who are non non-immigrants who um you know, have long historical um, uh, uh, families in the U.S. and who are also cutting, and and they are not included in this because we just simply have no way of knowing what the prevalence rates are at this stage in that community or where they are. And again, future research to be done in those areas. Speaking of future research, can you tell us what the next steps are in, in your research? Yeah, so, you know, it's that third variable. Um, the third variable that we that, that we have here in, in this in the two scenarios is let's assume the third variable doesn't exist. And then let's assume that the third variable is segmented into that 150, 25 um, breakdown. Um, but now trying to add nuance to that. So I've got two studies going on at the moment. I've got a survey um, that is out in, in the community uh, trying to get survivors to complete the survey in order to gather more nuanced data on how is risk changing, how is the social norm changing within their communities. And then linked to that, I have a series of uh, interviews that I'm doing with um, with survivors and with those working with survivors uh, to really try and understand how risk is changing, how the practice is changing, what impact does migration have on uh, attitude and on agency and on social norm and and, and really trying to nuance so, so we can we can put some nuance on on that third variable. I think that you could use some audience participation in, in both of those those studies. If if anyone listening is um, interested in supporting Sean in, in those efforts, you can also reach out to us at info at the aha and we'll be sure to connect you unless you wanted to share a different email address. But we're happy to field those and send them your way, Sean. That would be great. Yeah. Um I I would uh, I would love to try and get as many more surveys in as I can and a, a, a couple more interviews between now and kind of end of the year, early next year. And then the hope is to then be able to do the analysis uh, through next summer and, and write up the next, the next piece of this puzzle. I am, I am really, really looking forward to the results of, of your ongoing work, Sean. And, and I'm grateful that you're, you're taking this on as your focus. We are lucky that someone who is not in the U.S. nor from the U.S. is is interested in helping us with this. Um, okay, I I have a number of questions that are coming in, and I know right now that I am not going to be able to get to all of them, so I am just going to do my best, and I'm going to start with um, with this one. Um, can you elaborate on how you accounted for acculturation? You mentioned acculturation scenarios. Can you please explain those? Yeah. Um, so what I, as I said, I I segmented the population into three groups: those who um, migrated, bef uh, who were 
you know, cut before uh, before they migrated, uh, based on their age of migration. I'm just going to pull up that slide. Uh, those who uh, migrated during or before the age of cutting. So in the Somali context, cutting takes place sort of seven, eight, nine, ten. So anybody sort of below that was in was in this uh, was in the middle group here um in 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 this group and those that were you know migrated after that were assumed to be cut before they migrated and then those born in the US and so the scenario that i did is to say you know based on reading studies across europe and reading studies smaller studies in in the US broadly speaking it would seem that on migration, the risk drops by about half, and being born here means that the risk is is significantly less. You know, it drops seventy five percent. So if you if you take a Nigerian, let, let me just round nineteen percent back home. Let me round it to twenty because it'll be easier for my maths in my head. But a, a Nigerian who migrates after the age of cutting, let's assume twenty percent of them were cut. Those who migrate before or during the age of cutting. Uh, let's assume that it's 10%. And those that were born in the US, let's assume it's 5%. So we just we're we're halving and halving again the um the impact of my, you know, and so therefore that um the, the prevalence and therefore that accounts for the impact of migration. And that ultimately changes the 577 into 415. Okay, next question is. This is an enormous mission, given the size of the US. Are there many organizations able to push and deliver this education to professionals and to support survivors? And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna step in and answer a little bit of this, Sean, and you might want to jump in after me, but I'm gonna answer it in two ways. And the first is that um, the genius of Sean's research is that it shows us that we don't have to be everywhere all at once that there are places where we can have bigger bang for our buck by targeting um, places with a higher prevalence. So that's um, in a way good news. Um, I, although I agree with you, it is still absolutely an, an enormous mission. And the second thing I would say is that yes, there are a number of um, great organizations around the US that are doing incredible work. And I think that equipping them with information like Sean has given us is going to help them do their jobs better. And this is um, one of the reasons that we really wanted to be able to share it because at the AHA Foundation, we are limited by you know size and funding, not by the content of our ambitions or our hearts, but um, we know that we can't be everywhere all the time and that there are lots of organizations that are doing the work that's necessary. And we need all types of organizations that are doing this work. And thankfully we are seeing that too. So yes, although we need many more, that's how I would answer that. Yeah, I mean, to, you know, to your point, if we t I, I showed this map of uh, of sort of Greater New York earlier, but if we if we take New York State as an example, there's three smaller communities in sort of upstate New York where there are significant pockets, and then there's New York City, and so you know there's essentially four communities that we're then looking at and then even within new york city we really are are looking at you know at a couple of communities that are more specifically those communities um and then less specifically others and so one can target and i think that is what's needed is to is to identify the schools the the civic organizations um and that in these communities to target there but also the best prevention the best intervention is going to come from these communities and from stakeholders within these communities. And so as we build allies with these communities and engage with them, the, the manpower is where they are because that's where they are. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's about it. That for me is why partnership is so critical in, in all of this. So here's a question that I would have put probably with our, um, intro to FGM, but I think it's important to address anytime we're talking about it, if the question is there. And the question is, how strong is the link with Islam? And I will, I will start by saying that 
that FGM predates Islam and Christianity. It is not mandated by any major religion, although it is used by many families and communities who are practicing as in, an excuse for why they're doing it. So um, I and I'm going to I'm going to pass it over to Sean, hoping that you're going to talk a little bit about um, the countries in Africa that you've looked at and, and what it looks like there. I, I can, but I mean, I think even more pointedly, I, you know, if I think about the 10 women that I've interviewed in the last two weeks for the second part of the study, some of them were grew up Muslim, some of them grew up Christian, some of them grew up nothing. They're all survivors. And I think therein is, is the key is that, yes, there are religious arguments for and against the practice uh, in different uh, in different denominations, but it's it's not it's a it, it's a social norm it's a cultural norm it's it, it it's a cultural practice yeah the next question is if fgm is illegal in the us where is it taking place once they have immigrated i assume not in a hospital which creates a higher risk of complications for the child meaning that if it's not in a hospital it's a higher risk um, or does the family travel abroad to undergo fgm yeah the, the million dollar question i think um you know, I think, as as we said, most most survivors were cut before they came. Uh, of those who were who were cut after they migrated or were born in the U.S., some were cut on uh, you know back home. They they on a trip. Some a cutter came, and some were cut here. Those who were cut here. Some were cut in medical facilities, like the uh, the, the case in, in, um, a couple of years ago. Some uh, were, you know, were likely cut in the community. Um, it, it, you know, the the two cases in the UK. One was uh, uh, somebody was cut at home. The other was a a mum just last week. Uh, was the the, the case uh, concluded the mum traveled overseas with the child and she was cut back there and then of course the case in the US was in a medical facility uh, in in Africa we're seeing uh, uh, and, and in Asia we're seeing an, a, a massive increase in medicalization of the practice but by medicalization we don't necessarily mean hospital uh there's a there's a lot of stuff happening in in pharmacies for example in back rooms of pharmacies in in kenya and we know that um yeah it is the million dollar question and it is um we, we also had a case that was recently dismissed in the u.s where it was alleged that a, a girl had been taken overseas for for fgm as well so that's another another case that we've um, potentially seen, although, like I said, that was dismissed. Um, another question is, please explain the difference between prevention and protection. Oh, great question. You know, protection is this girl is at risk. How do we stop her from being cut? Prevention is this girl isn't at risk anymore because her community, her family have decided that this is just something we don't do. And I think that's where we're all heading. We we really want to prevent this um, so that we don't have to protect. Let me ask, let, let me answer Jill's question. I'll go for uh, it. Uh, Jill asked, does the report look at legislation in each of the states and any prosecutions? Uh, Jill, it doesn't look at prosecutions, but it does look at uh, the legislation in each of the states and makes recommendations for how those um, uh, leg the, those pieces of legislation can be strengthened. And if you have questions about any prosecutions, we're happy to respond to those via email for sure. Um, I had a question I wanted to, let me see, I'm looking for it. Um, Okay, uh, a comment slash question is, is I think it's now clear that simple multidisciplinary approaches are failing. Would you agree that in the end, there must be an identified person at each level of decision-making with whom the buck stops? 
a person who is actually responsible for outcomes. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and certainly in our work with survivors here at the AHA Foundation, in working with referring them to service providers for whatever they're they're seeking help for, we have definitely found that 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 is critical. We have to be that person that is, you know, where the buck stops because you can't just assume that if you found a um, a committed professional who is available and open to working with someone that they will actually follow through because we are all busy. Um, but I think that that you know, we are, we are certainly behind where Europe and, and the UK are in terms of, of addressing this issue, I think. And, and we really need a lot more of these networks that we're talking about. And something that we see in our trainings within the AHA Foundation, we really try to bring together these multidisciplinary um, teams to get them working together and thinking and talking about how they would respond to a particular scenario. Because, you know, if they don't know who to call, someone in, in the, the little network probably does know who to call. And and just like bouncing ideas off of each other and, and understanding what resources are available and who has what information makes it a lot less daunting when you have that case that comes forward so that you know, okay, I'm going to call so-and-so and get together with these people to figure out what what next steps are. But certainly it shouldn't just be, a you know, throwing it out into the wind and hoping that that there is then a solution. So I, I certainly hear your comment. Well, there's a question here from Hillary Burridge um, to, uh, making the comment that uh, talking of micro areas, this is incredibly important because decision makers then realize that they must respond to real people. Yes. Um, and yeah, absolutely, Hillary. And, um, you know, in, in the U.S., um, so much decision making is made at the county level. And so we did uh, quite a bit of work to try to get this data to be presented at that county level um, so that um, so, so that decision makers know what, you know, specifically what um, what kind of resourcing, what kind of policies are required at that level. But where um, the data is actually available at the at the at the smaller unit level at the you know what's called Puma level, and um, that's communities of about a hundred thousand. So some Pumas are a lot bigger than others just by the density of population. But in in the more urban areas where FGM tends to be more located, you do get down to you know it's in the northwest of the city, it's in the southeast of the city, and and I think that's the key so that you know which neighborhoods to really be focusing attention on and resources on. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, do kind of a two for one of of a question and a mm -hmm. comment that Toby sent in, and the the comment that I think is worth sharing with everyone is that. Ibo Wardari has a really good resource on elementary aged education for FGM in her memoir cut. So I think that that's really important for all of us to hear. But then I'm gonna I'm gonna give her the final question too and, and put it to you, Sean, before we before we wrap up today. To what extent have you turned to research akin to yours carried out in Europe? And then she she gives some more recommendations, which I'll share with you. Yeah. Um thanks, Toby. Uh, great question. Uh so Four previous studies in the U.S. Uh, that I that I looked at, and then about twenty five or so studies across Europe, um, done and a number of them done under the auspices of the European uh, uh, Gender Equality Institute, um, uh, the European Institute for Gender Equality. Um, and then also um, studies like the, the Netherlands study by Caboose um, uh, from 2021. You know, I, I've looked at pretty much all of them and I, I've i done, I've tried to really understand how has the extrapolation of prevalence model changed over time and built those, that learning into the, the maths that I did on this one and then try to take it the next step forward so that what I'm done here will be absolutely applicable back to anywhere else. And in fact, um, we're currently on a, uh, a study group in Canada looking at how we apply the updated methodology to the Canadian context. 
Let me just give her, give her a plug too. She says she'd like to recommend the forthcoming Rutledge International Handbook on Harmful Cultural Practices, which is mainly on FGM to appear in December of this year. So we can all look out for that. Um, I think that is going to be really all of our time that we have for you all today. Thank you so much, everyone. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to respond to all the questions that have come through. We have we have many more to respond to, and we will get back to you via email. And please feel free to reach out to us at info at the aha foundation.org if you have more. We are really excited to share this work with you. I'm really proud that it's finally out in the world. Um, and I really also want to thank, uh, in particular, AHA Foundation supporters who have made this work and all of our work possible. And particularly to Sean, thank you so much. I am so incredibly grateful for your work on this in the United States. It's a pleasure to work with you and I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes next. Well, thank you, Amanda, and, and thank you, AHA, for supporting this work. And who would have imagined that that presentation in DC five years ago would have landed us here, but here we are. Here we are. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.